Well, I, I, I first want to say I'm incredibly honored to be speaking here, and I want to thank Oliver for those embarrassingly kind words. Um, I also want to thank Charles Duggan for inviting me over here to speak to you. Um, so I suppose if I press next, hooray, yes. So um, architecture and climate, how the past can save the future. So that's, that's my um, topic today, and I hope, uh, I hope it, it's interesting. Funny enough, the conversation this, this morning I feel that most of what I've got to say has probably already been said, but anyway, um, we'll see. Um, so this first slide is a bit alarming, um, but I put it there because it's not from a publication by Just Stop Oil or Extinction Rebellion. It's the Financial Times, and this came out just before the COP in Glasgow. Uh, and I'm just going to read the top line there, which says, what's now at stake is nothing le less than everything. And I think for a kind of, if you like, an establishment paper like the FT to kind of realize and, and publishize this two years ago is, is quite an important point. Um, and it shows, I think, that you know, things, people are, the message is starting, but only just starting to get home. And I think that also I put this slide in next because in a sense, um, whilst we are relatively re comfortable here in, 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 in Northern Europe, if you like, um, there are people all over the world who are now suffering in the direct consequences of climate change. Um, but I thought what I would do is, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go heavy on graphs, you'll be pleased to hear, but I'm just going to show you a couple. Um, and the reason for this is because a lot of people say, ah, oh, well, we're just going through a blip, you know, it, 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 this is normal, it goes up and down, and we'll be back to normal in a, in a couple of decades. What this is showing, and if you look at the top line, which is carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, you will see, and the red line below is uh, Antarctic temperature. And this was um, from data sourced by the British Antarctic Survey. Now, both of these graphs cover the last 800,000 years. So that's a pretty significant period of time. And you'll notice two things about them. One is temperature and carbon follow each other around, if you like. And secondly, they go up and down roughly every 100,000 years. Um, and if you move over to the right-hand side of the graph, you'll look at the top there, top right, there's a little star, blue star, which is showing what it says current. In fact, that's a bit out of date. It's now about 425 parts per million. So it's gone up since this graph was done in about 2016. And you'll see, obviously, therefore, that that has jumped right out of the normal rhythm. Uh, and then below that, I've put in a, a red circle around the sort of top bit, which represents, if you like, the last 2,000 years. And if I effectively zoom in on that, this is um, uh, what the last 2,000 years look, looks like. Uh, and you'll see that, of course, it is variation year on year, and decade on decade. Um, and it highlights this, this diagram, um, things like the medieval warm period, the Little Ice Age over the sort of 15, 16, 17, 1800s. And then it shows, alarmingly, the graph rocketing up from about 1900. And that is, if you like, what's happening in parallel to that carbon dioxide and the little blue star. So, you know, this is significant and real. It is jumping out of the regular, um, if you like, rhythm of things. And I think, you know, anybody says, oh, well, it's just temporary. I think this sort of, and I'm not a climate expert by any means, but I mean, I think to me, this is pretty convincing. Um, so, if we look at what it is we're supposed to be doing, and certainly with the COP, the international agreements, um, the idea is to limit the temperature increase to one and a half, maybe two degrees at the outside. But this is showing what things might look like by 2100. And the blue line represents the one and a half degrees. Uh, and then at the top there, if countries do nothing, following current policies in the middle there, and based on current pledges. So obviously there's a gap between pledges, uh, policies, and actual real action. Uh, and so already we seem to be missing all these targets, and we're getting, you know, the, the things are not looking promising. Um, and this map here comes from, uh, I think it was, uh, I forget where I got it from, but what it's showing is what this piece of uh, the world would look like, and all the red bits will is what would happen 
with an increase in term temperature of only three degrees, never mind some of the bigger figures. So all that part of Holland um, and parts of England, and indeed, of course, those ladies I showed you with a child in the second slide, a uh, place like Bangladesh, um, and indeed places like Florida, I mean, but big parts of Florida will, will, will also suffer. So this is you know, pretty real stuff, and I think um, it is massively significant. And the paradox is that our politicians don't seem to kind of grasp this or, or, or grip this, um, or understood this. But if we look, who are the, who, who the guilty? Um, and various figures have been put, mentioned today um, about the kind of carbon emissions of, 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 of construction and so on. This is a, a, a sort of, a, and I, so I think the answer to this is that there are, ve you know, nobody's quite sure, but it is significant. So if you look at this diagram, um, you've got then red, concrete, steel, and aluminium. Now, obviously, not all steel and aluminium, or possibly even concrete, uh, are used for construction, but a large proportion are. Um, but equally, um, transportation, there's a lot of that 23% in transportation would be construction related. So whichever way you look at it, between the yellow and the red, i.e. built environment emissions, we're looking at about half, roughly, say. Um, and the building operations really rely, is about energy use. Um, and the rest of it is to do with um, uh, the carbon emissions from uh, construction. It's probably worth just mentioning what I understand these terms embodied carbon and what, the, what on earth they all mean. So for me, embodied carbon is to do with the emissions released as a consequence, in other words, the energy used and the consequent emissions from anything to do with materials. So this is sourcing materials, turning them into products, uh, transporting them to site, building a building, but also then replacing bits and pieces over the life of the building, and ultimately, when the building's demolished, anything to do with that, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and operational emissions is basically energy use, or in the case of something like a motorway, it would be things like car use, the petrol used by cars or trains, you know, and aeroplanes and so on. So um, that would, uh, uh, there's an element in, in there. Um, and then whole life carbon is really the combination of those first two. So whole life carbon is all the carbon emissions of an asset over its lifetime. So, so that's material, energy, everything else, repair, replacement, and so on. Um, so as I say, about half of emissions relate to the built environment. This is global, and obviously country vary. And I, you know, in an economy like Ireland or indeed the UK, um, it's probably a slightly smaller percentage than that 50%, if you like, allocated to the built environment. Um, and this is another way of looking at this, which is the global construction and is generally taken to be roughly the equivalent of one new greater London every six weeks. And you'll begin to appreciate, of course, it's not just a carbon argument, this is a resource-based argument. It's materials and, 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 and carbon emissions. And of course, that is a vast amount. I mean, greater London is probably, I don't know, 10 times the size of Dublin, let's say. So that gives you some idea. It's probably, you know, it's probably a Dublin every four days or something, which is you know, a ferocious uh, uh, level of, of expenditure of materials and, and, and emissions. And of course, a lot of that's related to things like uh, population growth. But equally, a lot of that's related to things that, are, frankly, in my view, unnecessary or need to be rethought. Um, so I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that given the, that pie chart I showed you and so on, that construction uh, and the built environment is probably gr a greater existential threat to humanity than nuclear war, which is quite a kind of extraordinary thought. But I think, you know, notwithstanding what's going on in Ukraine and so on, nevertheless, the uh, emissions and the threat of, uh, to us from construction is real, it's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just slow moving, so we don't notice it so much. Um, and I th thought I'd just quote Mark Carney. Now Mark Carney, as uh, you may know, was chair of the Financial Stability Board, and the FSB, as it's known, is the club of central banks. So all the central banks around the world have a club, and he was chair of it. He was also governor of the Bank of England, and he said, we can't get to net zero by flipping a green switch. 
Uh, we need to rewire our entire economies. And if you sort of pause and think about that second thing, that is pretty radical. And it's, it's sort of a saying that our economies are not really fit for purpose when it comes to climate change and dealing with it. And I suppose you then think, well, if the economies aren't fit for purpose, what about the politics? And how does this all connect up? And why isn't it working? I think what's interesting in the UK, we've got, on the one hand, a conservative government, which has said, which has passed legislation to achieve net zero by 2050, and with interim targets we'll come to. And, but at the same time, they're taking away all the ability to, 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 to do it. Um, and Rishi Sunak only just recently sort of took away a couple of pillars that would help that to be achieved. And they say, yes, yes, we're still good for net zero by 2050, but they're not enabling it to happen. Um, so this graph here um, sort of explains it. So the, uh, in 2019, the UK government passed legislation to achieve net zero, as indeed many other countries did by 2050. Um, and, but with a baseline in uh, 1990 of zero reductions down to 100% reductions in 2050. And then they passed further uh, another act of parliament in 2021 with an interim target and then a commitment at COP21, also in, um, uh, uh, also in 2021, of a further commitment. And those commitments basically all form the same line. They just support each other. And in essence, what it's saying is that the UK economy has to decarbonize at that rate to achieve, or, or, or that's the trajectory to achieve net zero by 2050. And of course, above the line I've got there is bad, and below the line is good. Um, now, if you look at construction on that for buildings that are, say, due to be finished in 2025, um, what that's showing is that most new build, which is what is happening now, is above the line. It's in the red zone. Uh, most new construction is sitting there. Obviously, high, uh, sorry, very efficient, low carbon new build is, tends to be below the line or, or on the line. And the major retrofits typically are uh, uh, below the line or on the line. So, that's why, one of the reasons why retrofitting and refurbishment is better, is, if you like, in carbon terms, is because it meets, if you like, the trajectory. I'm talking about the UK at the moment. I'll come to Ireland in a second. Um, but what is interesting about this is that if you look at uh, cost, the, the, the issue that concerns most people building, uh, whether it's offices or residential, whatever, is they want cost neutrality. They don't want to spend extra money on uh, achieving low carbon outcomes. And it is certainly possible with today's supply chain to get about 30% reductions without any extra cost, in my view. And certainly I've had ex direct experience in both residential and office of this being entirely achievable. What it requires is for the design team and the developer and so on to show enthusiasm for this. And am I getting picked up here? It's probably better to do that. Um, uh, that, that the developer and the design team have to sort of show willing and, and, and intent to, to achieve these things. Um, but obviously, if the developer can see that there is benefit, in other words, they can sell a green, in inverted commas, property at a higher premium, then they can afford to spend more than 30%. Uh, and of course, if government gets behind this, then what that means is that the supply chains start to innovate. Their supply chains are already innovating. I mean, um, I, I know of an example in Holland where you can, uh, there's a company which is extracting unused cement from concrete. And I didn't even know there was unused cement in concrete, but they're extracting it economically and selling it on. Uh, so, you know, that, those sort of innovations are really important. Um, and government needs to kind of get behind these things to, to, to do that, to encourage that. Um, now, what I find, I had a look at um, your uh, Climate Act, and it, this is from the government website, and, it's, and I put in the green box there, it says, the Act provides that the first two five-year carbon budgets proposed by the Climate Change Advisory Council should equate to a total reduction of 51% over the period to 2030, and relative to a baseline of 2018. So what that looks like is something like that. Um, in a sort of similar terms. So you've got a baseline of 2018, which means that 
there's less pressure initially, but the pressure ramps up much more quickly to 2050. Uh, and I put, I've left the same cost neutral line on, but I've changed that um, uh, arrow going downwards um, to, to, because you've got less red at the top of the arrow. You may be wondering what the little red bit is at the bottom. Well, the little red bit at the bottom is because if you do a lick of paint on something, which is what a number of people might do, it just delays the inevitable. You still have to go back and do a proper refurbishment or retrofit at a later date. So that's your Act of Parliament in, in the middle of that line, and that just kind of gives an, an idea. Um, what I was also interested to look at, looking at Dublin City Plan for 2022 to 2028, which is obviously relatively new, you've got a couple of things which I thought were really great. And um, I say that, I mean, I uh, co-authored the GLA London Plan on Whole Life Carbon. And I wish I'd thought of this at the time, uh, because um, this is really helpful, I think. So in the top box, it says, in line with this overall approach, proposals for major retrofitting of existing buildings should seek to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, improve the efficiency of resource use. Uh, and then it goes on to say, another key mitigation measure in relation to the built environment is to ensure that proposals for substantial demolition reconstruction works can be justified having regard to the embodied carbon of existing structures, as well as the additional use of resources and energy arising from new construction relative to the reuse of existing structures. So, you know, that's fantastic. I think, you know, you've, you've, it's a question of making sure you can pin this on the developers, and obviously the developers like to wriggle when this stuff's being pinned on them, and I'll come on to that uh, a, a, a bit later. Um, but I thought I'd just show you something. This is some work, we did some work for Grosvenor Estate in London, um, over about 400 of these properties. Uh, and these are, uh, this in the case is Georgia, but Georgian and Victorian terraces and so on. And we then sort of collected data and we were doing everything from sort of regular uh, retrofit to meet current regulations, parallel and so on. But we were also doing uh, more exotic retrofits sort of to NFIT standard. And we were doing in some cases sort of new passive house. And what was really interesting is, and, and this is not our diagram, this is from Hawkins Brown, but it's, it's quite well drawn. We, we produced a very similar diagram, but it was just more complicated to look at. So what this is showing is comparing demolition and rebuild in the green line uh, along the top there, and retain and retrofit in the bottom line. And it's showing what happens over 60 years. So the argument you normally get from developers is, well, we must demolish this tidal building because it's grossly inefficient in energy terms and if we can build a nice new building um, it will be more efficient and so on. I've probably mentioned I'm not against new build at all provided it's in the right circumstances um, and the bottom line is retain and retrofit if you keep the building. I'll explain how these diagrams work. So on the left hand side you've got a, on the green line you've got a tall vertical bit and that is the embodied carbon cost of construction. Then you've got a horizontal bit running from left to right, which is the energy use over a period roughly 20 years or something. And then you've got a little step, and that step is uh, where you're replacing the plant and services as an embodied carbon jump, if you like. And then you'll see the, the, the horizontal line gets more or less flat, um, and there's another step, so you know, again, replacement and so on. And the reason the lines are flat is because what they're saying is that the buildings are super energy efficient, and the assumption is that if the building is finished, to, let's say, this year, it might be reasonably energy efficient, but it'll be even better after the next 20-year retrofit. Now, if you look at the blue line, the blue line is showing, obviously, a much lower embodied carbon cost at the outset. Um, and obviously, that length of that vertical blue line depends on how much work you're doing, whether it's a big refurbishment with extra floors on it, or it's just an internal refit for environmental performance reasons. And then you've got the, 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 the sort of diagonal line going up, uh, which is showing that it's, the assumption is that it's less efficient to, ref, to, to uh, upgrade an existing building. And then you've got similar steps as you go from left to right. Uh, a number of architects I've spoken to said, well, actually, they think they can get the new uh, a refurbishment today to pretty much the same sort of quality level of environmental performance as a, as a brand new building. So anyway, what this is showing is that certainly over 60 years, um, you've got a situation where your re refurbishment or retrofit 
um, is more efficient overall than a new build, um, even an, an efficient new build. And the reason, of course, is that you've got that big hit at the outset. Um, so provided you do do environmental improvements to your existing building, you, you, you know, you're, you're well ahead. Um, now, these, are, uh, uh, these drawings are meant to be a Georgian terrace, but the sharp-eyed of you will notice all the windows are the same height, so I won't dwell on that point. But anyway, so what we looked at, so on the left there, you've got sort of the building as is, um, and obviously that is very inefficient in terms of energy use. Then we've got um, fabric first in the middle there, which is that building, but now we've uh, insulated it um, and we're making it just more efficient. And I think there may be, there's double glazing or secondary glazing probably more effectively, or not so much more effectively, but certainly less damaging. Um, and we've got maybe things like PV panels on the roof. So then the third option is knock it all down and build a new passive house that's roughly the same size. And uh, not surprisingly, based on that dark graph I just showed you, the lowest one, of course, is the one in the middle, which is the retrofit. But I think the important point here is that we have to be prepared. If we're going to value sort of heritage assets, um, we are going to have to enable ourselves to be, to accept changes. I mean, I remember not that long ago where the idea of putting a lift into a Georgian terrace was unthinkable, um, whereas now it's accepted as, as a necessary part of uh, retaining the use and the value within a building of that type. And I suppose it's a question of how do we do this? You know, how do we, for example, I mean, I don't even say this in here, but um, how do we insulate a room like this? Uh, and I notice we're all sitting here with our woolly pullovers on and scarves and things. So, you know, these things are, 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 I think for sort of certain public buildings, you know, obviously we t you take a different view, but for buildings that are being used as office space or residential, how do we ensure that they remain valuable to society? And I think we have to be a bit more flexible in how we allow them to be uh, modified. Um, and I think that actually we're entering a really exciting time speaking from an architectural perspective. And I think that the climate crisis is leading to an entirely new architecture. I think we're at the cusp of it at the moment. Um, but I think for architects and, and indeed for users of buildings, I think we've got you know, some really interesting possibilities coming forward. Um, and I think that a lot of this is about materials, but it's also about reuse. <clears throat> and these four examples on the top left there, that is Cork House, which we had some involvement with uh, looking at the carbon costs, but that building is entirely made out of cork, it's baked, um, and apart from the baking and the travel, which are high carbon activities, the rest of it was incredibly low. So these were, this was a ridiculously low carbon building. Bottom left is um, a building by Archetype, uh, which is an office building for the University of East Anglia, and it's clad in thatch. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's obviously ridiculous because that doesn't last very long. But actually, when you think about it, your average, you won't get a warranty out of an aluminium piece of cladding for more than 10, 15 years. Um, and this is being used vertically, so it will probably last even better than a sort of roof type situation. So it's not that crazy. So that's, that's materials. But I'm not going to, I'm not, today is not a materials discussion day. Today's a reuse discussion day. And on the right there, um, on the bottom right, you've got um, uh, Hayworth Tompkins' uh, Sterling Prize winning uh, Everyman Theatre. And in that, they reused a lot of materials from the existing building. So bricks and timber uh, structure and so on were reused. But I think the sort of one that's more typical of what we're talking about possibly today is, this is just a Victorian warehouse. I'm not sure who did the architect was for the extension. But this is where, of course, the building has been um, retrofitted, refurbished, and of course they put an extra floor on. And I think it's that kind of um, recognition that we can reuse these buildings, but also add to them and, and, and adapt them. Um, so um, this is to explain, so you'll notice I've got heritage value, and there's probably sort of sucking in of teeth going on at the moment, but I put heritage value pale because uh, although as an architect I'm not obviously immune, and personally I'm not immune to the, the heritage benefits and importance of, of buildings. But when I'm coming at this very specific, 
principally from is from a sort of carbon emissions and a resource optimization position. And that is because it's sort of there's a clarity for me about that. The heritage value that a lot of people who know a lot more than I do, and in this room certainly, um, who people who can make the heritage case. And clearly, um, I think the interesting point here is that, uh, and, and I'll come on to Mark Spence in a minute, but how um, the heritage and the environmental arguments run in parallel, not totally overlapping, but substantially overlapping. Um, and as I say, I'm coming at this from a carbon and resource optimization issue, and if that means putting you know, extra floors onto something, then the heritage argument might be, well, you shouldn't be putting five floors on top of that building, you might put two on, or whatever it is, or, or none, or, 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 or whatever. So I'd just like to make that point, and so it's a point I made to save Britain's heritage uh, as part of the, the um, Marks and Spencer issue. So um, I want to talk about sort of, yeah, retrofit, refurbishment, and imagination, and I think this is a really important point, as I've sort of touched on it already, which is that we shouldn't be frightened of existing buildings, whether they're heritage or just regular buildings, if you like. And we've heard a lot this today about buildings from the 1970s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I think, for me, those buildings are incredibly valuable resources, which and also we've heard sort of similar comments, um, that these resources should not be uh, uh, thrown away. And, I, and certainly, I, I, the, um, there was talk, uh, there, was, uh, there was Ellen, oh, who was Carol, I think. So I'm trying to bring my notes here. Um, I was writing stuff down furiously this morning. Um, yes, so, uh, sorry, Carol Pollard was talking about the AIB Bank Center. Now, to me, the dem demolition of something that's relatively young like that, which is 40 years old, is, you could argue, is a kind of climate crime. Um, and really, people probably should be in prison for that kind of thing. Um, but I, 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 what I want to show you is, is just a few examples of reuse of buildings where people have been imaginative. And I'm not saying these are particularly low carbon. I don't actually know where they aren't. But I thought I'd just start with, so this is a small thing. This is a French farmhouse, um, and it's pretty unspectacular. But what they've done is something quite clever with it. Um, they've chopped a big chunk out of it, which you might argue from a heritage perspective is a bit uh, random. Um, uh, and they've done things to the roof, which might not be entirely acceptable, but still. What they've done is they've shown that you can put new life into an, an, into an old building. And I'm going to show you a few examples that I think are kind of interesting. This is one by um, David Morley Architects at Bradford. Uh, and, I, and I know that um, you know, these sort of big old industrial revolution type buildings uh, are, are, you know, are still a resource. And this has been re retrofitted throughout the main part of the building. But of course, what they've also done is put something pretty unusual on the roof. Uh, and, uh, and I think. It's that kind of thing which I think is really exciting and, and, and shows great potential uh, of how these things can be, these buildings can be kind of given a new lease of life, a new image, um, and become fit for purpose in the 21st century. Um, and this one, in fact, there was a slide this morning, uh, you know, yesterday, I think um, Susan had this, this, this one, Susan McDonald had this. Uh, anyway, so I'm sort of stealing her sort of thing, really. But um, this is a, a grain silo in Cape Town uh, in South Africa. Um, and it's a sort of classic sort of concrete frame industrial building. And what it's been turned into is um, a kind of a hotel, restaurant, uh, exhibition space, and so on. You can see on the right there uh, where it's been hollowed out. Those silos have been hollowed out to create the most amazing space. Um, and they've knocked out, as Thomas Heatherwick, so they've knocked out all the panels in, in, in the concrete frame up above and put these sort of bug-eye windows. So again, this is sort of showing, and I don't know what the carbon cost of this is, but demolition is usually a lot less than construction, if I can put it sort of simplistically like that. But nevertheless, what they've done is taken a very unpromising looking building and turned it into something really quite amazing. And this comes back to my you know, use of imagination, not being frightened of buildings. Um, this one I, is, a, is a gin distillery in, in, Mil, in Milan, um, and it's uh, OMA. Uh, and what they've done is this building was, you can see on the facade on the street, this building was pretty much it was derelict, uh, and it was then turned into a, a, a gin distil, distillery. And what they've done is, well, you can see it from the photograph, they've put in some sort of fairly 
I suppose, both loud and quiet at the same time, if that makes sense. But they've um, done some fairly sort of uh, careful kind of compositional things, but nevertheless uh, done something fairly dramatic to uh, revitalize and reuse this building. And I use this one. This is a 13th century church, a Dominican um, church in from the Dominican order um, in, 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 in uh, Maastricht. Um, and it's been turned into a library. Now, some people might be a bit alarmed about what has been put in there. But the fact of the matter is, is that this building um, has now been given a, a whole new lease of life as a library. And it's now full of people. Uh, and you can see down there at the bottom, at the top there, you can now be go up, you go up to the upper stacks you're not up in them, almost up in the vault. Uh, uh, and so you, I think what's happened here is that they haven't been overly precious. They haven't, on the other hand, damaged the original fabric, arguably possibly apart from the floor. But what they have done is given a new purpose and new life to this building. Um, and finally, on, on this sort of series, before I get onto the sort of case studies, I want to show you this. This is um, a building in London. Uh, which backs onto something called Bleeding Heart Yard. Um, and you can see this is a, a 1970s building. Um, and if you look on the, the extreme left of the left-hand photograph, you can see a little Victorian sort of warehousey type building. Now, the, on the right-hand uh, photograph, you can see the building sort of recesses in. And that part of the building faces onto a little courtyard, which is Bleeding Heart Yard. And in fact, that recess in the 1970s building is actually completely wrecks the kind of experience of that little courtyard. And what the architect uh, Amintaha has done is this. Um, now, what you're looking at is the same structure. So he hasn't taken the structure down. What he has done is he's filled in that recess to complete the courtyard. But what you're looking at here is, is uh, perforated steel cladding that's been overlaid onto the facade. Um, and it's like a sort of, and it's not exactly pastiche, but it, it's, it's like a sort of ghost of what was there before, because what he's done is researched the previous facades and then had made out of metal additions. So if you look on the, on the left-hand side of the left-hand picture, you can see that little Victorian building again. And all that stuff to the right of it, i.e. the new facade, the, is metal. And the rain will go straight through it. It's, 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 just a, it's, it's not even a rain screen. It's just a, a, a decorative bit. But what it has done is, kind of, if you like, have sort of re-imagined uh, the street and brought back the buildings that were there. But he's also given himself a bit of license and so on. So I mean, that's a kind of slightly weird example of how you might deal with these things. But what he has done is it, 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 it's relatively low carbon. What's also interesting is that it's starting to solve some other issues. Um, and these are, so this has been taken by a Swiss bank, uh, Julius Baer. Um, and it's about, it's, it's a, as finished, it's about 30,000 square feet. Um, and the problems it's solved is firstly, people like Julius, you know, a lot of these companies now are with a younger demographic. Um, so, you know, you're talking about employees in the sort of ages of 30 to 40 ish are more concerned about the environment and, and, and so on. And for them, uh, being in a building that is not ostentatiously gobbling up, you know, air conditioning as a big shiny box and so on. I'll come on to big shiny boxes in a minute. Um, but is, if you like, more environmentally concerned is, is of interest. The second thing is the sort of pro post-COVID problem of working from home. Uh, and one of the problems that a lot of big companies have got in the, in, in, in the um, city of London, for example, and this is not in the city, it's, it's, in, it's in Farringdon, um, is that uh, because of the COVID, a lot of people don't want to do a full five-day week in an office building. They want to do maybe three, three days a week, two, three, four days a week. And so suddenly these buildings are now substantially empty for chunks of the week, and they of course, the employers want to entice people back in. And what they're finding is that people like to go back in if there's an interesting building to go into. And of course, going to this is far more interesting. And I've been around it. Um, it's a much more interesting building. It's used a lot of timber and so on and so forth. So it's a much more interesting and positive experience 
even though compared to the 1970s previous version, if you like, there's less window, it actually is a much more pleasant experience, a more interesting experience being in this building. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk two case studies. One is um, Selkirk House, um, which is a concrete box. <laughs> um, and the other one is Marks and Spencer. So the one on the left, Selkirk House, um, is uh, there's a planning application in, uh, and it's been grinding along for a few months, well, maybe a year or so now. Um, and I'm doing a, working on it in a similar way as I was working with Marks and Spencer. So the developer wants to knock it down and build a, a much new, a new, much bigger building. Um, and this sort of gives you an idea. So on the left there, you've got the existing building or group of buildings because it's the, it's the, it's the tower which is kind of used as a uh, hotel. And then you've got Victorian buildings around the base of it. And those Victorian buildings were listed only a couple of months ago or a few months ago. So that sort of stymied, uh, the, not the developer's going to knock them down, but it, it restricted what they were trying to do to them. And then you can see on the right, you've got a proposed uh, new building. And of course, what the developer was explaining is that that proposed new building is significant, you know, what I was saying a bit earlier, is significantly more efficient and it's better to have it and so on and so forth compared to the original building. Of course, the irony here is, is that the new facade, that aluminum uh, curtain wall facade that you're looking at, will probably have to be replaced in about 40 years after it's completed, roughly. It might be 45, 50, it might be 35, whatever. Um, the facade on the left is currently about 45 years old, and the windows need replacing. But the rest of it, uh, you know, as, as, as we've heard from various talk speakers t t today and, and, and Susan yesterday, um, you know, there may need to be work done to the facade, but fundamentally it's, in, it's, it's, it's actually in good, perfectly all right shape, and certainly the engineers have confirmed that. Um, so you're swapping a kind of one sort of thing for arguably a, a worse thing, although it is shiny and new. And of course, replacing individual windows is one thing, but that facade on the right there is uh, a, a unitized system. So you know, each piece of facade is probably two to three stories high and about three or four bays wide. So it comes in big pieces. Now, it's possible to change an individual piece of glass in it or the double glazed unit, but to replace any more than that becomes really problematic. Um, now, I'm not going to take you through the gruesome detail of these, but basically what I did was do a detailed analysis of the planning application and the carbon argument that went with it, because Camden claim uh, that they want to do um, carbon reduction at a fast rate than the government, and they're going to achieve net zero better and quicker and all the rest of it. But paradoxically, what they're proposing or to accept on this project runs a coach and horses all through their own policies. But of course, this building will produce them a nice lot of rates, so it's not entirely surprising that they want to approve it. So what I was looking at, I'm not going to as I go through the detail, but first of all, I looked at things like um, national policy uh, on uh, you know, net zero, national net zero policy, also GLA policy, um, and of course, Camden policy. And when you look at all those policies, um, they all show uh, intent uh, about net zero and carbon emissions reduction and so on, but they don't necessarily give you a kind of absolute guarantee. I think the American term is a slam dunk. You don't get a slam dunk, you've got to do it. Um, so what I was doing in my first bit of argument was to explain why this building misses out on national and in, uh, London and Camden intentions and policies and things. And then the other thing I was looking at was the carbon assessments themselves. And these are done by you know, proper assessors and so on, but it's to try and figure out where they've exaggerated or got things wrong or, or, or whatever. Um, in addition, there's always these claims about all these targets. And, and, and in the UK, we have LETI targets. Um, and LETI is a sort of a, a grassroots organization, London Energy Transformation uh, something. Um, uh, there's RIBA targets and there's London targets. And it's to show that these targets, whatever the claims of the um, developer, are really not being met. Um, 
And then there's all the usual things, which, and again, I'll come into this more detail with Mark and Spencer, but there's always claims that the existing buildings are no good because of this, that, and the other. And this is to try and, you know, for example, floor ceiling heights. In fact, this building meets British Council for Offices guidelines for refurbishment. Not surprising, because this building was originally built as an office building. <laughs> so the thing to, do, what I, you know, what I try and do with these sort of things is to get through all the smoke and mirrors and, and work out what the, um, you know, why these things are, 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 are why the, the, there's, I hesitate to use the word lies, but there's all this nonsense going on in, 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 in this world. So now I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about Arcs, uh, Marx and Spencer. Um, and the Marx and Spencer site is not just that building in the middle of this photograph. It's also the red brick building on the left of the central building. And it's also, you can just see on the top right, or top right there, just next to the pillar, and that's Selfridges, incidentally. There's a, you can see a couple of stories there. That building there is also part of the site. So um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a big site, and it's not just the corner building. And actually, that corner building's been knocked about a bit. I think if one was sort of, uh, what is interesting about it is it, it's, it's probably not an architectural gem, but on the other hand, it is an important cultural gem. And a lot of people relate to it and think of it as an important part of you know, their experience. And I think, the, as, as Olo mentioned, um, this project started in about 2018, and Marks and Spencer have been running this site down intentionally, uh, internally and externally. So the bottom of that red brick building is full of kind of rubbishy tourist things selling those things, you know, the queen with two holes in the thighs, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, on the other side of the street are some very fancy fashion shops. So, you know, there's no excuse. It's just an intentional thing. Um, the other thing about the central building is that it has, and I'll come onto this a bit more in a, in a, in a second, but the, it's got generations of rubbish in it. I mean, you know, it's got all the internal, all the windows have been blocked up. It's got about 50 years of plant, you know, they've just laid stuff on top of each other and it's got all sorts of other horrors going on. Um, uh, so um, that's what they're proposing to replace it with. And um, the, whether you like it or not is really not the point in my perspective. Um, it is to do with the carbon cost and so on. And, and extra over to doing a refurbishment of the existing buildings, to do this, to build it, Straight away, you're going to be dumping 40,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, bang, at the point of construction. Um, and if you look at um, this site as a whole, I, I said it was a group of buildings. So if you look at this, this shows you in the center there, you've got the, the sort of 90-year-old building. And then you've got the two buildings on either side, which are 42 and 49 years uh, uh, each, uh, respectively, rather. Um, and I suppose it comes back to the point I was making earlier about AIB, which is, you know, is this, a, you know, surely it, it, it's a crime to be demolishing buildings that are um, less than 50 years old, certainly, and certainly capable of reuse. Um, and this whole issue of reuse, um, uh, as I say, Mark Spencer went out, of their, went out of their way to trash these buildings, which I will explain uh, as we go along. Um, so the claim about the new building was that it was a 120-year building. This was claimed by the architect publicly uh, on numerous occasions. But paradoxically, it's obviously not. <laughs> um, and if you look at this diagram, these are my colors. So the red represents everything on the outside that has to be replaced after 35 years. Now, that's not my number. That is from Arabs who did the carbon assessment, um, incidentally done by an ex-employee of mine. So I, of course, it's absolutely perfectly brilliant. <laughs> Um, and then the long life material, which is the green, which is those, it's a sort of screen around the, with, with windows in, but the, the green bit is, 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 a, is a concrete frame with brick and stone in it. So, you know, there's no reason why that shouldn't last 120 years. So, you know, and of course, internally, you've got all the uh, plant and services uh, and partitioning, all that would, 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 would have to be replaced as well. And indeed, so, you know, the, 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 and, and if you look at the, the, the proposed against the existing or part of the existing, this is the red brick building. Actually, all you're doing is shifting things 40 years, if you like. So the building on the left will be in the same position in 40 years' time as the building on the right is today. 
So, you know, this is obviously shows a, a kind of a nonsense to the whole thing. Um, and the other thing was that the, the, the developer claimed that they had done extensive um, refurbishment examinations, and, and this was from out of their document. And this is the, the, the these 16 little studies they claimed was we, we've exp, you know, examined this in great detail, and we've done 16 studies. Now, if you actually look at this in detail, which I've done, not one of those is a refurbishment. They are all variations on a new build. And then I put all there plus a lick of paint option. So when they went public with this, they said, well, if you compare taking these existing buildings and giving them a lick of paint, they didn't use those terms exactly, but it was, that's what it boiled down to, um, with no environmental enhancement, no new this, no new that, obviously that was going to fail in relation to a shiny new building. And so that, at the end of it, was what they were saying uh, was, you know, justified the, you know, the, the, the demolition. They'd done all this work. And, of course, the paradox was, was that this project for Mark, Mark Spence, they started on this in 2018. And these studies actually date from 2018. And 2019, as you may remember, I said that the government's legislation came in uh, about net zero. Well, nobody at Marks & Spencer, who, if you look at their website, claim to be very concerned about the environment. They have a thing called Plan A, which is all about the environmental concerns. It even mentions the scourge of demolition and waste and all this sort of stuff. Despite that all being on their website, they are, you know, they were pushing ahead with this from, you know, say, 2018. Now, where we are now, in sort of overall terms, is as, as Oliver said, the, um, it was given to Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, who dropped it like a hot potato. It was straight out of his office, within, literally within 48 hours. Um, it went to Michael Gove, who uh, called it in and asked for a public inquiry. And that involved a, a sort of guerrilla QC who sort of beat me up and various other people up. And um, anyway, the outcome of that was that it then came back to Mike Gove. And <laughs> for those of you taking any sort of vague interest in politics in, in, in the UK, you'll notice that there's been sort of endless musical chairs. And by some sort of strange, wonderful quirk of fate, Michael Gove, having called it in, got fired, got brought back. Oh, the thing's gone out. Oh, back again. Um, so by the time he got back in his job, he was able to chuck it out, so to speak. Um, so that was very fortuitous. Um, and where we are now is that Marks and Spencer got very upset, threw all their toys out of the pram, and they, uh, it's now gone to the High Court. So it's no longer involving any... It's, it's now lawyer versus lawyer. So Marks and Spencer are spending, no doubt, large sums of money on lawyers and the government of doing it, for, you know, obviously dealing with that. But the, the, the irony about this is that the new building is 60,000 square metres, and I worked out that if you kept the existing buildings and, it's gone out again, uh, uh, and, and extended it by a, a few floors, um, and Arabs' own calculations reckoned you could get between one and three floors on all the different bits. So it was possibly extended. You could get about 50,000 square meters. Uh, and if they'd done that from the outset, they would have been finished and they'd be making money out of it now, rather than even if they, get, even if they win at the high court, they won't be finished until 10 years after they started. So, you know, you think, well, this is all crazy. Um, anyway, so just to sort of, on, so this, these are the floor plates. On the left there, you've got the existing typical floor plate, uh, first floor plan. On the right, you've got the new build floor plate. Um, and as you can see on the left there, it's a real muddle. I mean, there's all sorts of, and it's worse in real life. But there's all sorts of things like extra columns, which turn out to be plants, bits of you know, riser and so on. Uh, and there's all sorts of, st it's been added to and changed over the decades. Um, so it's a real mess. And on the right, there you've got a nice clean plan with a central core and so on. But I believe that you could actually replicate very much the same thing. If you cleared out all those cores, opened up the windows, you'd have something very similar. And the justification for this was the structure. So this is an Arab's diagram which shows the existing structure. And you'll notice very simple grids. So all the existing structure is perfectly basic once you get through all the fog. But of course, they didn't want to know about that. Um, and then uh, this is the ground floor. And I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but it, just to say that 
you, if you look at the yellow in both of them, we were providing, or this diagram on the, on the left there, is providing far more retail. Now, Marks and Spencer sold this on the grounds that it is a retail building. This is a nonsense because the existing Marks and Spencer building has 300,000 square feet of retail in it. The new one on the right will have 100,000, a third. So this is not about retail. This is about providing them with a big, shiny office building. And certainly when I looked at the share price uh, of Marks and Spencer, at the time of the inquiry, Marks and Spencer was capitalized at about two billion. And if they'd built this building, let it and sold it, they might have got about 900 million to a billion. So this building in it, on its own sold would probably, at that, that point in time, been worth about half of the total capital value of Marks and Spencer. Marks and Spencer's share price has gone up a lot, so it's now only about a quarter, but it's still proper money, I mean, to do this. So you can see why they are so desperate. A refurbishment, even if you extend it and so on, would be worth less than that. That is true, but as I mentioned a bit earlier, if you got on with it and had done it, you'd be making money. Um, and they had all the usual arguments about floor to ceiling height, uh, which I, I know we're moving on, so I'm gonna keep clicking along now. But they, again, all the story heights were fine uh, in terms of the way you might use offices today. Um, and the other thing was this claim about being a nice green building was they were proposing to extend the existing basement and add two further levels. Well, digging holes in the ground and filling them with concrete is not a green activity. Um, so, you know, that was suspect. So, oops, that's, oh, I've got them here. Oh. Um, so, uh, I suppose these are sort of some, some quick points about making the case for retention. Um, so, there's carbon policy, got, and, and you know, this is focusing on national, local, and uh, GLA policy in this case, and local Westminster policies, and, and how to use those to make the case. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, in Dublin, you've got some great stuff uh, here. Um, examine all relevant documentation. So that's not just the planning documents, but it's anything else that's floating around. Demonstrate the value of the existing, really important. Show that this can be used. I mean, I think I would avoid trying to do an alternative scheme personally, because I think what that does is give the opposition a target to attack. Um, what I did was a kind of bubble diagram. And even then, they attacked that and said, oh, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, get public support. And of course, part of that is involving celebrities. And we managed to get some celebrities involved, um, which get, gives you press coverage. And in fact, it went from not being noticed. And then the Architects Journal picked this up. And then that led to the Evening Standard. And then that led to the Nationals and the Financial Times and this, that, and the other. And I put here, examine the opposition's websites, because there's always little sneaky, embarrassing things you can pull out and make them uncomfortable. Um, and then I'm just going to, a couple of minutes, literally, uh, I've only got two slides on this. Um, but this is the RICS Whole Life Carbon Professional Standard for 2023. And this came out at the end of September. Um, and what it's doing is, is, is um, really big, working out and, and, and giving sort of guidance to um, the uh, new net zero carbon building standard and so on. And I'll just explain that diagram quickly. So on the left, that circle, you've got international standards, uh, li uh, life cycle LCA standards. Uh, and those form the sort of backdrop to all of this sort of thing. And then you've got the blue thing in the middle, the big thing is the, um, is UK, in, in this case, UK implementation. Um, and then on the right there, top, you've got the UK net zero carbon building standard, which is um, gonna be published in the new year, but is basically come out of the, the RICS and the international standards. And then in the middle there, you've got BECD, which is the Built Environment Carbon Database, which is a reporting database. And then you've got Part Z, which has not happened, but is and, and something I'm involved in as well, which is an industry proposed regulation. So this is like the equivalent of um, Part L in, in the UK. This is Part Z, which is um, to do with whole life carbon in, 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 in construction. In, you know, so if you're doing a, a building regulations application, this would come in. And then there's all those guidances, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them, but there's a whole range of guidances along the bottom there. Uh, and also feeding into tools. So things like uh, one-click LCA, e-tool, and so on. Um, 
So, um, finally, thank you very much. And uh, that, that, that was the book that was mentioned, which is now a, a, a bit old. But that, uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>